Hello. I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome you to the Merrimack High School Theater Company's production of Much Ado About Nothing. We are happy to be able to bring this production to you in spite of all the challenges we've faced this year. Your students have worked very hard, and I'm so very proud of them. If you're able, take this opportunity to point your device at the screen and download the program for our show with information about our talented cast and crew. Now, I'd like you to sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. letter that Don Pedro of Argon comes this night to Messina. He's very nearby this. He was not three leagues off when I left him. How many gentlemen have you lost in this action? But few of any sort and none of name. A victory is twice itself when the Atreva brings home full numbers. I find here that Don Pedro hath bestowed on much honor on a young Florentine called Claudio. Much deserved on his part and equally remembered by Don Pedro. He hath borne himself beyond the promise of his age, doing, in the figure of a lamb, the feats of a lion. I pray you, is Signor Montanto returned from the wars, or no? I know none of that name, lady. My cousin means Signor Benedict of Padua. Oh, he's returned, and as pleasant as ever he was. I pray you, how many hath he killed and eaten in these wars? But how many hath he killed, for need I promise to eat all of his killing? Faith, niece, you tax Signor Benedict too much, but he'll be meet with you, I doubt it not. He hath done good service, lady, in these wars. You had musty victual, and he hath folk to eat it. He is a very valiant trencherman. He hath an excellent stomach. And a good soldier, too, lady. And a good soldier, too, a lady. But what is he to a lord? A lord to a lord, a man to a man, stuffed with all honorable virtues. <laughs> it is so indeed. He is no less than a stuffed man, but... As for the stuffing, well, we're all mortal. You must not, sir, mistake my niece. There is kind of a merry war betwixt Signor Benedict and her. They never meet, but there is a skirmish of wit between them. <laughs> Alas, he gets nothing by that. In our last conflict, four of his five wits went halting off, so that was the whole man governed by one. And if, him, if he have wit enough to keep himself warm, let him bear it for a difference between himself and his horse, for it is all the wealth he had left to be known a reasonable creature. Who is his companion now? He hath every month a new sworn brother. Is it possible? Very easily possible. His faith changes, but as the fashion of his hat, it ever changes with the next block. I see, lady. The gentleman is not in your books. No, and he were, I would burn my study. But who is his companion now? Is there no young swearer that will make voyage with him to the devil? He is most in the company of the right noble Claudio. Oh, Lord, he will hang upon him like a disease. He is sooner caught in the pestilence, and the taker runs presently mad. God help the noble Claudio. If he have caught the Benedict, it will cost him a thousand pounds ere be cured. I will hold friends with you, lady. Do, good friend. You will never run mad, niece. No, not till a hot January. Good Signor Leonardo, you have come to meet your trouble. The fashion of the world is to avoid cost and you encounter it. Never come trouble into my house in the likeness of your grace. For trouble being gone, comfort should remain. And when you depart from me, sorrow abides and happiness takes its leave. Oh, you embrace your charge too willingly. I think this is your daughter. Her mother hath many times told me so. Were you in doubt, sir, that you asked her? <laughs> Signor Benedict, no, for then you were a child. Truly, the lady fathers herself. Be happy, lady, for you are like an honorable father. If Signor Leonardo be her father, she would not have his head on her shoulders for all Messina, as like him as she is. I wonder that you will still be talking, Signor Benedict. Nobody marks you. What, my dear lady disdain, are you yet living? 
Is it possible the stain should die when she hath such meat food feed it as Signor Benedict? Courtesy itself must convert to disdain if you come in her presence. Then is courtesy a turncoat, but it is certain I am loved by all ladies, only you accepted. And I would I could find in my heart that I had not a hard heart, for truly I loved none. A dear happiness to women, else they would be troubled with a pernicious suitor. I thank God and my cold blood I am of your humor for that. I'd rather hear my dog bark at a crow than a man swear he loves me. God, keep your ladyship still in that mind, so some gentleman or other shall scape a predestinate scratched face. Scratching could not make it worse than twere such a face as yours were. Well, you are a rare parrot teacher. A bird of my tongue is better than a beast of yours. I would, my horse, had the speed of your tongue, and so good a continuer. But keep in your way, God's name I have done. You always end with the jade's trick. I know you of old. Signor Benedict, my dear friend Leonardo hath invited you all. I tell him we shall stay here at least a month, and he hardly prays some occasion may detain us longer. Let me bid you welcome, my lord. Being reconciled to the prince, your brother, I owe you all duty. I thank you. I am not of many words, but I thank you. Please it your grace lead on. Your hand, Leonardo. We will go together. Benedict. Didst thou note the daughter of Signor Leonardo? I noted her not, but I looked on her. Is she not a modest young lady? Do you question me as an honest man should do for my simple true judgment? Or would you have me speak after my custom as being a professed tyrant to their sex? No, I pray thee, speak in sober judgment. Why in faith, methinks she too low for a high praise, too brown for a fair praise, and too little for a great praise. Only this commendation I can afford her. That were she other than she is, she were unhandsome, and being no other but as she is, I do not like her. Thou thinkest I am in sport. I pray thee, tell me truly how thou likest her. Would you buy her that you inquire after her? Can the world buy such a jewel? Yea, and the case put it into. But speak you this with a sad brow? In mine eye, she is the sweetest lady that ever I looked on. I can see without spectacles, and I see no such matter. There's her cousin, and she were not possessed with fury, exceeds her as much in beauty as the firth of May doth the lath of December. But I hope you have no intent to turn husband, have you? I would scarce trust myself, though I had sworn the contrary if here would be my wife. Shall I never see a bachelor of three score again? Go to in faith, and thou wilt needs thrust thy neck into a yoke, wear the print of it, and sigh away Sundays. What secret hath held you here, that you followed not to Leonardo's? I would, your grace, would constrain me to tell. I charge thee on thy allegiance. You hear, Count Claudio, I can be as secret as a dumb man. I would have you think so, but on my allegiance, mark you this, on my allegiance. He is in love. With who? Well, that's your grace's part. Mark how short his answer is. With hero, Leonardo's short daughter. Amen, if you love her, for the very lady is very well worthy. You speak this to fetch me in, my lord. By my troth, I speak my thought. And in faith, my lord, I spoke mine. And by my two faiths and troths, my lord, I spoke mine. That I love her, I feel. That she is worthy, I know. That I can neither feel how she would be loved, nor know how she would be worthy, is the opinion that fire cannot melt out of me. I will die in it at the stake. Thou wast ever an obstinate heretic in the despite of beauty. And never could maintain his part but in the force of his will. That a woman conceived me, I thank her. That she brought me up, I likewise give her the most humble thanks. But that I will have a reed sheet winded in my forehead or hang my bugle in an invisible baldric, all women shall pardon me. Because I will not do them the wrong to mistrust any. I will do myself the right to trust none. And the fine is, for which I may go the finer, I will live a bachelor. I shall see thee, ere I die, look pale with love. With anger, with sickness, or with hunger, my lord, not with love. Well, as time shall try, in time the savage bull doth bear the yoke. The savage bull may, but if ever the sensible Benedict bear it, Pluck it off the bull's hung, pluck off the bull's horns and set them in my forehead, and let me be vilely painted 
and in such great letters as they write, here is the good horse to hire. Let them signify under my sign. Here you may see Benedict, the married man. If this should ever happen, thou wouldst be horn mad. Nay, if Cupid have not spent all his quiver in Venice, thou wilt quake for this shortly. I look for an earthquake too, then. Have Leonardo any son, my lord? No child but hero. She's his only heir. Dost thou affect her, Claudio? Oh, my lord, when you went onward on this ended action, I looked upon her with a soldier's eye, that liked, but had a rougher task in hand than to drive liking to the name of love. But now I am returned, and that war thoughts have left their places vacant, and their rooms come thronging soft and delicate desires, all prompting me how fair a young hero is, saying I liked her, ere I went to wars. Thou wilt be like a lover presently, and tire the hero with a book of words. If thou dost love, fair hero, cherish it, and I'll break with her and with her father, and thou shalt have her. I know we shall have reveling tonight. I will assume thy part in some disguise and tell fair hero that I am Claudio, and in her bosom I'll unclasp my heart and take her hearing prisoner with the force and strong encounter of my amorous tale. Then after her, to her father I will break, and the conclusion is she shall be thine. Let us pract in practice, let us put it presently. What the good year, my lord? Why are thus out of measure sad? There is no measure in the occasion that breathes. Therefore, the sadness is without limit. You should hear reason. And when I have heard it, what blessing brings it? If not a present remedy, at least a patient sufferance. I cannot hide what I am. I must be sad when I have cause and smile at no man's jests. Eat when I have stomach and wait for no man's leisure. Sleep when I am drowsy and tend on no man's business. Laugh when I am merry and claw no man in his humor. Yea, but you must not make the full show of this till you may do it without controlment. You have late stood out against your brother, and he hath taken you newly into his grace. Where it is impossible, you should take a true root, but by the fair weather you make yourself. It is needful that you frame the season of your own harvest. I had rather be a canker in a hedge than a rose in his grace. And it better fits my blood to be disdained from all than to fashion a carriage to rob love from any. In this, though, I cannot be said to be a flattering, honest man. It must not be denied, but I am a plain-dealing villain. Trusted with a muzzle and enfranchised with a clog, therefore I have decreed not to sing in my cage. If I had my mouth, I would bite. If I had my liberty, I would do my liking. In the meantime, let me be as I am and seek not to alter me. Can you, know, can you not make use of your discontent? I make all use of it, for I use it only. Who comes here? What news, Baraccio? I came yonder from a great supper. The prince, your brother, is royally entertained by Leonardo, and I can give you intelligence of an intended marriage. Will it serve for any model to build mischief on? What is he for a fool that betroths himself to unquietness? Mary, it is your brother's right hand. Who? The most exquisite Claudio? Even he. A proper squire. And who, and who? Which way looks he? Mary, on Hero, the daughter and heir of Leonardo. A very forward march, chick. How came you to this? Being entertained for a perfumer, I was smoking a musty room. Comes me the prince and Claudio, hand in hand in sad conference. I whip me behind the arras, and heard it agreed upon that the prince should woo Hero for himself, and having obtained her, give her to Count Claudio. Come, come, let us thither. This may prove food to my displeasure, that young startup hath all the glory of my overthrow. If I can cross him any way, I bless myself every way. You are both sure and will assist me? To the death, my lord. Was not Count John here at supper? I saw him not. How tartly that gentleman looks. I can never see him, but I'm heartburned an hour after. He is of a very melancholy disposition. 
he were an excellent man that were made just in the midway between him and Benedict. The one is too like an image and says nothing, and the other, too like my lady's eldest son, evermore tattling. <laughs> then have a Signor Benedict's tongue in Count John's mouth, and then half of Count John's melancholy in Signor Benedict's face. With a good leg and a good foot, uncle, and money enough in his purse, such a man could win any woman in the world if he could get her goodwill. By my troth, niece, thou wilt never get thee a husband if thou be so shrewd of thy tongue. For the which blessing I am adding upon my knees every morning and evening. Lord, I could not endure a husband with a beard on his face. I'd rather lie in the woolen. You may light on a husband that hath no beard. <laughs> what should I do with him? Dress him my apparel and make him my waiting gentlewoman? A man that hath no de- a man that hath a beard is more than a youth, and a man that hath no beard is less than a man. And he that is more than a youth is not for me, and he that is less than a man, I am not for him. Well, daughter, I trust you will be ruled by your father. Yes, Faith. My cousin will make curtsy and say, Father, as it please you. But for all that, cousin, let him be a handsome fellow, or else make curtsy again and say, Father, as it please me. Well, niece, I hope to see you one day fitted with a husband. And that's will God make men of some other metal than earth. Lady, will you walk about with your friend? So you walk softly and look sweetly and say nothing. I'm yours for the walk, and especially when I walk away. With me in your company? I may say so when I please. And when please you to say so? When I like your favor, for God defend the loot should be like the case. My visor is Philemon's roof, within the house is Jof. Why then, your visor should be thatched. Speak low if you speak low. Well, I would you did like me. So would not I. For your own sake, I have many ill qualities. Which is one? I say my prayers aloud. I love you the better. The hearers may cry. Amen. God match me with a good dancer. Amen. Will you not tell me who told you so? Uh, uh, no, you shall, you shall pardon me. Nor will you not tell me who you are. Not now. That I was disdainful, that I had my good wit out of the hundred merry tales. Why, this was Signor Benedict that told you so. What's he? I am sure you know him well enough. Not I, believe me. Did he never make you laugh? I pray you, what is he? Why, he is the prince's jester, a very dull fool. Only his gift is in devising impossible slanders, none but libertines delight in him, and the commendation is not in his wit, but in his villainy, for he both pleases men and anchors them, and they laugh at him and beat him. I am sure he is on the fleet. I would he had boarded me. When I know the gentleman, I'll tell you what, what to say. Do, do, but he'll break a comparison or two on me, which, peradventure not marked, not laughed at, will strike him into a melancholy. And the poor fool will eat no supper that night, and there will be a partridge ring saved. We must follow the leaders. In every good thing. Nay, if they lead any ill, I will leave them at the next turning. Are you not Signor Benedict? You know me well. I am he. Signor, you are very near my brother in his love. He is enamored on Hero. I pray you, dissuade him from her. She is no equal for his birth. You may do the part of an honest man in it. How know you he loves her? I heard him swear his affection. So did I too. He swore he would marry her tonight. Come, let us to the banquet. Thus answer I, in the name of Benedict. But hear these ill news with the ears of Claudio. Tis certain so, the prince woos for himself. Friendship is constant in all other things, save in the office and affairs of love. Therefore, all hearts in love use their own tongues. Let every eye negotiate for itself and trust no agent. For beauty is a witch, against whose charms faith melteth into blood. This is an accident of hourly proof, which I mistrusted not. Farewell, therefore, hero. Count Claudio. Yea, the same. Come, will you go with me? For the prince hath got your hero. I wish him joy of her. Did you think the prince would have served you thus? I pray you leave me. Oh, now you strike like the blind man. Twas the boy that stole your meat, and you'll beat the post. If it will not be, I'll leave you. Alas. Poor hurt fowl. 
Now will he creep into sedges. But that my lady Beatrice should know me and not know me. The prince is fool. <laughs> it may be I go under that title because I am merry, yea, but so I am apt to do myself wrong. I am not so reputed. It is the base, though bitter, disposition of Beatrice that puts the world into her person and so gives it gives me out. Well, I'll be revenged as I may. Now, senor, where's the count? Did you see him? Oh, my lord, I have played the part of Lady Fame. I found him here as melancholy as a lodge in a warren. I told him, and I think I told him true, that your grace had got the good of this young lady. The Lady Beatrice hath a quarrel to you. The gentleman that danced with her has told her she is much wronged by you. Oh, she misused me past the endurance of a block. An oak, but with one green leaf on it, would have answered her. My very visor began to assume life and scold with her. She, she told me, not thinking I had been myself, that I was the prince's jester, that I was duller than a great thaw, huddling jest upon jest with such impossible conveyance upon me that I stood like a man at a mark with a whole army shooting at me. She speaks poniards and every word stabs. If her breath were as terrible as her terminations, there were no living near her. She would infect to the North Star. I would not marry her, though she were endowed with all that Adam bad left before him before he transgressed. She would have made Hercules have turned spit, yea, and have cleft his club to make the fire too. Come, talk not of her. You shall find her the infernal apes in good apparel. I would to God some scholar would conjure her, for certainly while she is here... A man may live as quiet in hell as in a sanctuary. And people sit on purpose because they would go thither. So indeed, all disquiet, horror, and perturbation follows her. Oh, look, here she comes. Will your grace command me any service to the world's end? I will go on the slightest errand now to the antipodes that you can devise to send me on. I will fetch you a toothpicker now from the furthest inch of Asia. Bring you the length of Presser John's foot. Fetch you a hair off the great champ's beard. Do you any embassage to the pygmies rather than hold three words conference with this harpy? Have you no employment for me? None but to desire your good company. Oh, God, sir. Here's a dish I love not. I cannot endure my lady's tongue. Come, lady, come. You have lost the heart of Signor Benedict. Indeed, my lord. He lent to me a while, and I gave him use of it, a double heart for his single one. Mary, once before, he went of me with false dice, so therefore your grace may well say I have lost it. You have put him down, lady. You have put him down. So I would not he should do me, my lord, lest I should prove the mother of fools. I have brought Count Claudio, whom you sent me to seek. Why, how now, Count? Why far are you sad? Not sad, my lord. How then, sick? Neither, my lord. The count is neither sad nor sick nor merry nor well, but civil count, civil as an orange, and something of that jealous complexion. In faith, lady, I think you're blazing to be true. Though I'll be sworn if he be so, his conceit is false. Here, Claudio, I have wooed on thy name, and fair hero is one. I have broke with her father, and his good will obtained. Name the day of marriage, and God give thee joy. Don't take of me, my daughter, and with her my fortunes. His great... His grace hath made and me have made the match, and grace say amen to it. Speak, Count, tis your cue. Silence is the perfectest herald of joy. I was a little happy if I could say how much, lady. As you are mine, I am yours. I give away myself to you and dote upon the exchange. Speak, cousin, or if you could not, stop his mouth with a kiss and let him not speak neither. In faith, lady, you have a merry heart. Yea, my lord, I thank it, poor fool. It keeps on the windy side of care. My cousin tells him in his ear that he is in her heart. And so she doth, cousin. Good lord for alliance. Thus goes everyone to the world but I, and I am sunburnt. I may sit in a corner and cry hi-ho for a husband. Lady Beatrice, I will get you one. I would rather have one of your father's getting. 
Hath your grace ne'er a brother like you? Your father got excellent husbands, if I may come by them. Will you have me, lady? Oh, my lord, unless I may have another for working days. Your grace is too costly to wear every day. But I beseech your grace, pardon me. I was born to speak all mirth and no matter. Your silence offends me most. And we merry best becomes of you, for we're out of question, you were born in a merry hour. No, sure, my lord. My mother cried, but then there was a star dance, and under that I was born. Cousins, God give you joy. By my troth, a pleasant spirited lady. There's a little of the melancholy element in her, my lord. She is never sad, but when she sleeps, and never sad then. For I heard my daughter say she often dreamed of unhappiness and waked herself with laughing. She cannot endure to hear tell of a husband. Oh, by no means. She mocks all of her wooers out of suit. She were an excellent wife for Benedict. <coughs> oh, Lord, my Lord, if they were but a weak, married, <coughs> they would talk themselves mad. Count Claudio, when mean you go to church? T tomorrow, my Lord. Time goes on crutches to love have all his rights. <laughs> Not till Monday, my dear son, which is hence just a seven night and the time too brief to have all my have all the things answered in my mind. I warrant thee, Claudio, the time shall not go dully by us. I will, in the interim, undertake one of Be Hercules's labors, which is to bring Signor Benedict and the Lady Beatrice into a mountain of affection, the one with the other. I would fain have it a match, and I doubt not but to fashion it. If you three will but minister such, such assistance as I shall give you direction. My lord, I am for you. The cost me ten nights' watchings. And I, my lord. And you too, gentle hero? I will do any modest office, my lord, to help my cousin to a good husband. And Benedict is not the most unhopeless husband that I know. Thus far I can praise him. He is of noble strain, of approved valor and confirmed honesty. I will teach you how to humor your cousin, that she shall fall in love with Benedict. And I, with your two helps, will so practice on Benedict that in the despite of his quick wit and queasy stomach, he shall fall in love with Beatrice. If we can do this, Cupid is no longer an archer. His glory shall be ours, for we are the only love gods. It is so. The Count Claudio shall marry the daughter of Leonardo. Yea, my lord, but I can cross it. Any bar, any cross, any impediment will be medicinable to me. I am sick in displeasure to him, and whatsoever comes athwart his affection ranges evenly with mine. How canst thou cross this marriage? Not honestly, my lord, but so covertly that no dishonesty shall appear in me. Show me briefly how. I think I told your lordship a year since how much I am the fa in the favor of Margaret, the waiting gentlewoman to Hero. I remember. I can, at any unseasonable instant of the night, appoint her to look out her lady's chamber window. Whose life is in that, to be the death of this marriage? The poison of that lies in you to temper. Go, to, go you to the prince, your brother. Spare not to tell him that he hath wronged his honor in marrying the renowned Claudio, whose estimation you mightily hold up to a contaminated stale, such a one as hero. What proof shall I make of that? Proof enough to mix use the prince, to vex Claudio, to undo Hero and kill Leonardo. Look you for any other issue? Only to fight them, I will endeavor anything. Go then, find me a meet hour to draw Don Pedro and Count Claudio alone. Tell them that you know that Hero loves me, and tend a kind of zeal both to the prince and Claudio, as, in love of your brother's honor, who hath made this match, and his friend's reputation, who is thus to be cozened with the semblance of the maid, that you have discovered thus. They will scarcely believe this without trial. Offer them instances, which be shall bear no less likelihood than to see me at her chamber window. Hear me call Margaret Hero, and hear Margaret turn me Claudio. Bring them to see this very night before the intended wedding. For in the meantime, I will so fashion the matter that Hero shall be absent. And there shall appear such seeming truth of hero's disloyalty that jealousy shall be called assurance and all preparation overthrown. Grow this to what adverse issue it can. I will put it in practice. Be cunning in the workingness, and thy fee is a thousand ducats. 
Be you constant in the accusation, and my cunning shall not shame me. I will presently go learn the day of their marriage. I do much wonder that one man, seeing how much another man is a fool when he dedicates his behaviors to love, will, after he hath laughed at such shallow follies in others, become the argument of his own scorn by failing in love. And such a man is Claudio. I have known when there was no music with him but the drum and the fife, and now had he rather hear the tabor and the pipe, I have known when he would have walked ten mile afoot to see a good armor. And now... Will he lie ten nights awake, carving the fashion of a new doublet? He was wont to speak plain and to the purpose, like an honest man and a soldier. And now is he turned to orthography. His words are a very fantastical banquet, just so many strange dishes. May I be con so converted and see with these eyes? I, I cannot tell, I think not. I'll not be sworn, but... Love may transform me to an oyster, but I'll take my oath on it. Till he have made me an oyster of me, he shall never make me such a fool. One woman is fair, yet I am well. Another is wise, yet I am well. Another virtuous, yet I am well. But till all graces be in one woman, one woman shall not come in my grace. Rich she shall be. That's certain. Wise or none virtuous or I'll never cheapen her, fair or I'll never look on her, mild or come not near me, noble or not I for an angel of good discourse, an excellent musician, and her hair shall be of whatever color it please God. Ha, huh. the prince and monsieur love, I'll hide me in the arbor. See where Benedict hath hid himself. Oh, very well, my lord. Come hither, Leonardo. What was it that you told me of today? That your niece Beatrice was in, in love with Signor Benedict? Oh, I stock on, stock on, the falsets. I did never think that lady would have loved any man. No, nor I neither. But most wonderful that she should so dote on Signor Benedict, whom she hath in all outward behaviors, seem ever to abhor. Is it possible? Sits the wind in that corner? <laughs> By my troth, my lord, I cannot tell what the think of it, but that she loves him with an enraged infection. It is past the infinite of thought. You amaze me. I would have thought her spirit been invincible against all assaults of affection. I would have sworn it, my lord, especially against Benedict. I should think this is a gull, but that the white-bearded fellow speaks it? Never he cannot, sure, hide himself in such reverence. He hath attained the infection. Hold up. Hath she made her affection known to Signor Benedict? No, and she swears she never will. That's your torment. True is true indeed, so your daughter says. Shall I, says she, that have so often encountered him with scorn, write to him that I love him? This says she when she is beginning to write to him. For she will be up twenty times a night, and there will be a sh she and there she will sit in her smock till she writ a sheet of paper. My daughter tells us all. Now you talk of a sheet of paper. I remember a pretty jest your daughter told us of. Oh, when she had written in the, and was reading it over, and she found Benedict and Beatrice between the sheet. That. <laughs> oh, she tore the letter into a thousand halfpence, railed it at herself that she should be so immodest to write one that she knew would flout her. I measure him, says she, by my own spirit. For I should flout him if he writ to me, yea, though I love him, I should. And down upon her knees she falls, weeps, sobs, beats her heart, tears her hair, prays, curses. Oh, sweet Benedict, God give me patience. It were good that Benedict knew of it by some other, if she will not discover it. To what end? He would make but a sport of it and torment the poor lady worse. And he should. It were an alms to hang him. She's an excellent sweet lady, and out of all suspicion, she is virtuous. And she's exceeding wise. <laughs> and everything lo but loving Benedict. I am sorry for her, as I have just caused being her uncle and her guardian. I would she had bestowed this dotage on me. I would have daft all other respects and made her half myself. I pray you, tell Benedict of it and hear what he will say. We're good, thank you. 
Hero thinks surely she will die, for she says she will die if you love her not. And she will die ere she make her love known. And she will die if he woo her, rather than she will bait one breath of her accustomed crossness. She doth well. If she should make tender of her love, tis very possible he'll scorn it. For the man, as you all know, has contemptible spirit. He's a very proper man. Eh, he hath indeed a good outward happiness. Before God, and in my mind very wise. Eh, he doth indeed show some sparks that are like wit. And I take him to be valiant. As Hector, I assure you. And in the managing of quarrels, you may say he is wise, for either he avoids them with the most Christian-like fear, or he undertakes them with great discretion. If he do fear God, I must necessarily keep peace. If he break the peace, he ought to enter into a quarrel with fear and trembling. And so will he do, for the man doth fear God. However, however it seems not in him by some large jests he'll make. Well, I am sorry for your niece. Shall we go seek Benedict and tell him of her love? Never tell him, my lord. Let her wear it out with good counsel. Nay, that's impossible. She may wear her heart out first. Well, we will hear further by your daughter. Let it cool the while. I love Benedict well, and I could wish, and I would wish, but he would just examine himself to see how much he is so unworthy of a good lady. My lord, will you walk? Dinner is ready. If you do not dote on her upon this, I will never trust my expectation. Let there be the same nuts bed for her, and that must your daughter and a gentlewoman carry. The sport will be when they hold one another of an opinion of the other's dotage, and no such matter. That's the scene I would see, which will be merely a dumb show. Let us send her to call him in to dinner. This can be no trick. The conference was sadly born. They have the truth of this from Hero. They seem to pity the lady. It seems her affections have their full bent. Love me, why it must be requited. I hear how I am censured. They say I will bear myself proudly. If I perceive the love come from her, they say too that she would rather die than give any sign of affection. I did never think to marry. I must not seem proud. Happy are they that they hear their distractions and can put them to mending. They say the lady is fair. Tis the truth. I can bear them witness and virtuous tis so I cannot reprove it and wise but for loving me my troth it is no addition to her wit nor no great argument of her folly for I will be horribly in love with her for I will be I may take chance have some odd quirks and remnants of wit broken on me because I have rallied so long against marriage but doth not the appetite appetite alter a man loves the meat in his youth that he cannot endure in his age. Shall quips and sentences and these paper bullets of the brain awe a man from the career of his humor? No, the world must be peopled. When I said I would die a bachelor, I did not think I should live till I were married. Here comes Beatrice. By this day, she is a fair lady. I do spy some marks of love in her. Against my will, I am sent to bid you come in to dinner. Fair Beatrice. <laughs> I thank you for your pains. I took no more pains for those thanks than you took pains to thank me. If it had been painful, I would not have come. You take pleasure then in the message. Yay, just so much as you take upon a knife's point and choke it out with all. You have no stomach, senor. Fare you well. <laughs> Against my will, I am sent to bid you come in to dinner. There's a double meaning in that. I took no more pains for those thanks than you took pains to thank me. That's as much to say, any pains that I take for you is as easy as thanks. If I do not take pity of her, I'm a villain. If I do not love her, I'm a fool. I'll go get her picture. Good Margaret, run me to the parlor. There, there shalt thou find my cousin Beatrice proposing with the prince and Claudio. Whisper in her ear and tell her, I and Ursula walk in the orchard, and our whole discourse is all of her. Say that thou overheard us, and bid her steal into the pleached bower where honeysuckles ripen by the sun. Forbid the sun to enter like favorites made proud by princes that advance their pride against the power that bred it. There she will hide her, to listen to her purpose. This is thy office. Bear thee well in it, and leave us alone. I will make her come. I warrant you presently. Now, Ursula, when Beatrice doth come, as we do treat this alley up and down, our talk must only be of Benedict. 
When I do name him, let it be thy part to praise him more than man ever did merit. My talk to thee must be how Benedict is sick in love with Beatrice. Of this matter it is little Cupid's crafty arrow made that only wounds my hearsay. No, truly, Ursula, she is too disdainful. I know her spirits are as coy and wild as the haggards of the rock. But are you sure that Benedict loves Beatrice so entirely? So says the prince and my new troth lord. And did they bid you tell her of it, madam? They didn't. They did entreat me to acquaint her of it, but I persuaded them. If they loved Benedict, wish him wrestle with affection and never let Beatrice know of it. Why did you so? Doth not the gentleman deserve as full of fortunate a bed as ever Beatrice shall couch upon? Oh, of course. Oh, God of love, he doth deserve as much as may be yielded to a man, but nature never framed a woman's heart of prouder stuff than that of Beatrice. Disdain and scorn ride sparkling in her eyes, despising what they look upon, and her wit values itself so highly that to her all else matters seem weak. She cannot love, nor take shape, nor project of affection. She is so self-endeared. Sure, I think so, and therefore certainly it were not good she knew his love, lest she make a sport at it. Why, well, you speak truth. I never yet saw a man how wise, how noble, young, how rarely featured, but she would spell him backward if fair face, she would swear the man gentleman should be her sister. If black, why nature's drawings of an antique made foul blot. If taut, a lean, ill headed, if low, an agate very vilely cut, if speaking, why a vein blown with all winds, if silent, why a block moved with not none. She turns every man to the wrong side out and never gives to truth and virtue, which simpleness and meant purchases. Sure, sure. Such carping is not commendable. No, not to be so odd and from all fashions as Beatrice is. Cannot be commendable, but who dare tell her so? If I should speak, she would mock me into air. Oh, she would laugh me out of myself, press me to death with wit. Therefore, let Benedict, like covered fire, consume away in sighs, waste inwardly. It were a better death than to die with mocks, which is as bad as dying with tickling. Yet tell her of it. Hear what she will say. No, rather I would go to Benedict and counsel him to fight against his passion, and truly I'll devise some honest lenders to stain my cousin with. One do doth not know how much an ill word may empoison liking. Oh, do not do your cousin such a wrong. She cannot be so much without true judgment, having so swift and excellent a wit, as she is prized to have, as to refuse, so rare a gentleman as Signor Benedict. He is the only man of Italy, always accepted, my dear Claudio. She's limed, I warrant you. We've caught her, madam. If it proves so, then loving goes by half. Some Cupid kills with arrows, some traps. What fire is in mine ears? Can this be true? Stand I condemned for pride and scorn so much? Contempt, farewell, and maiden pride adieu. No glory lives behind the back of such. And Benedict? Look on, I will requite thee, taming thy wild heart to thy loving hand. If thou dost love, my kindness shall incite thee to bind our loves up in a holy band. For others say thou dost deserve, and I believe it better than reportingly. Are you good men and true? Yea, or else it were pity, but they should have to suffer salvation, body, and soul. Nay, that were a punishment too good for them, if they should have any allegiance in them, being chosen for the prince's watch. We'll give them their charge, neighbor Dogberry. First, who think you the most desertless man to be constable? You Oatcake, sir, or George Seacole, for they can write and read. Come hither, neighbor Seacole. God hath blessed you with a good name. To be a well-favored man is a gift of fortune, but to write and read comes by nature. Both which, Master Constable. You have. I knew it would be your answer. Well, for your favor, sir, why, give God thanks, and make no boast of it. And for your writing and reading, let that appear when there is no need of such vanity. You are thought here to be the most senseless and fit man, for the constable of the watch. Therefore, bear you your lantern. This is your charge. You shall comprehend all vagrom men. You are to bid any man stand in the prince's name. How if I will not stand? Why then, take no note of him, but let him go and presently call the rest of the watch together and thank God you are rid of a knave. If he will not stand when he is bidden, he is none of the prince's subjects. 
true. And there to meddle with none but the prince's subjects. You shall also make no noise in the streets, for the watch to, for, for the watch to babble, to talk, is most tolerable, and not to be endured. We will rather sleep than talk. We know what belongs to a watch. Why, you speak like an ancient and most quiet watchman, for I cannot see how sleeping should offend. Only have a care that your bills be not stolen. Well, you are to call at all the alehouses and bid those that are drunk get them to bed. How if they will not? Why then, let them alone till they're sober. If they make you not the better answer, you may say they are not the men you took them for. Well, sir. If you meet a thief, you may suspect him, by virtue of your office, to be no true man. And for such kind of men, the less you meddle or make with them, the more is for your honesty. And if we know him to be a thief, shall we not lay hands on him? Truly, by your office, you may. But I think they that touch pitch will be defiled. The most peaceable way for you, if you do take a thief, is to let him show himself for what he is, and steal out of your company. You have always been called a merciful man, partner. Truly, I, I would not hang a dog by my will, much more a man who hath any honesty in him. If you hear a child cry in the night, you must call a nurse and bid her still it. How if the nurse be asleep and will not hear us? Why then, depart in peace, and let the child wake her with crying. For the ewe that will not hear the lamb when it bays will never answer a calf when he bleats. Tis very true. This is the end of the charge. You, constable, are to present the prince's own person. If you meet the prince in the night, you may stay him. Nay, by our lady, that I think I cannot. Five shillings to one unto with any man that knows the statutes. He may stay him. Marry, not without the prince, be willing. For indeed, the watch ought to offend no man, and it is an offense to stay a man against his will. Nay, by our lady, I think it be so. Ha <laughs> ha, well, masters, good night. And there be any matter of weight chances, call me up. Keep your fellow's counsel in your own, and good night. Come, neighbor. Well, masters, we hear our charge. Let us go sit here upon the church bench till two, and then all off to bed. Adieu. Be vigilant, I beseech you. What, Conrad? Peace, stir not. Conrad, I say. Here, man, I'm at thy elbow. Mass, and my elbow itched. I thought there would a scab fellow. I will owe thee an answer for that, and now forward with thy tale. Stand thee close, then under this penthouse, for drizzles rain, and I will, like a true drunkard, utter all to thee. Some treasons, masters, yet stand close. Therefore I know I have earned Don John a thousand ducats. Is it possible that any villainy should be so dear? Thou shouldst rather ask if it were possible any villainy should be so rich. For when rich villains have need for poor ones, poor ones may make what price they will. I know that scoundrel has been a vile thief this seven year, a goes up and down like a gentleman. I remember his name. Didst thou hear somebody? No, twas the vein on the house. I have tonight wooed Margaret, the lady Hero's gentlewoman, by the name of Hero. She leans me out her mistress's chamber window, bids me a thousand times good night. I tell this tale vilely. I should first tell thee how the prince, Claudio, and my master, planted, placed, and possessed by my master Don John, saw afar off in the orchard this amiable encounter. And thought they Margaret was Hero? Two of them did, the prince and Claudio, but the devil, my master, knew she was Margaret, and partly by his oaths, which first possessed them, partly by the dark night, which did deceive them, and chiefly by my villainy, which did confirm any slander that Don John had made, away went Claudio in rage, swore he would meet her as he appointed next morning at the temple, and there, before the whole congregation, shame her for what he saw or night, and sent her home without a husband. We charge you in the prince's name. Stand. Call up the right master, constable. We have here recovered the most dangerous piece of lettery ever known to the commonwealth. Masters. 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 Never speak. We charge you. Let us obey you to go with us.
Ursula, wake my cousin Beatrice and desire her to rise. I will, lady. And bid her come hither. Well. Oh, I think your other gown were better. No, pray thee. Good Meg, I'll wear this. But my troth's not so good, and I warrant your cousin will say so. My cousin's a fool, and thou art another. I'll wear none but this. Good morrow, cuz. Tomorrow, sweet hero. Why, how now do you speak in a sick tune? I am out of all other tune, methinks. Pops into I love. That you that goes without a burden, do you sing it, and I will dance it. Be a light of love with your heels. Then if your husband have stables enough, you'll see you shall lack no barns. Oh, illegitimate construction. I scorn that with my heels. Tis almost five o'clock, cousin. Tis time you were ready. I might hurt I am exceedingly ill. I hope. For a hawk, a horse, or a husband. For the letter that begins them all. H. These gloves that the Count sent me, they are an excellent perfume. I am stuffed, cousin. I cannot smell. A maiden stuffed? There's goodly catch of cold. Oh, God help me. God help me. How long have you professed apprehension? Even since you left it, doth not my wit become me rarely? It is not seen enough. You should wear it in your cap. My troth, I am sick. Get you some of this distilled Cardigus Benedictus and lay it to your heart. It's the only thing for a qualm. Benedictus? Why Benedictus? You have some moral in this Benedictus? Moral? No, by my troth, I have no moral meaning. I mean plain holy thistle. There thou prickest her with a thistle. Madam, withdraw. The prince, the count, Sigur Benedict, Don John, and all the gallants of the town have come to fetch you to church. Help to dress me, good cuz, good Megan, good Ursula. What would you with me, honest neighbor? Mary, sir, I would have some confidence with you, that, with you that discerns you nearly. Brief, I pray you, for you see, it is a busy time with me. Mary, this it is, sir. Yes, in truth it is, sir. What is it, my good friends? Good man Virgis, sir, speaks a little off the matter. An old man, sir, and his wits are not so blunt as God help I would desire they were. But in faith, honest is the skin between his brows. Yes, I thank God I am as honest as any man living that is an old man and no honester than I. Comparisons are odorous. Silence, neighbor Virgis. Neighbors, you are tedious. Oh, it pleases your worship to say so, but we're the poor duke's officers. But truly, for mine own part, if I were as tedious as a king, I could find it in my heart to bestow it all of your worship. All thy tedi tediousness is on me? Yea, and twere a thousand pound more, for tis for I hear as good exclamation on your worship as any of a man in the city. And though I be but a poor man, I am glad to hear it. And so am I. I would fain know what you have to say. Mary, sir, our watch tonight, expecting your worship's present, had taken a couple of his errant knaves as any in Messina. A good old man, sir. He will be talking. I must leave you. One word, sir. Our watch, sir, have indeed comprehended two auspicious persons, and we would have them this morning examined before your worship. Take their examination yourself and bring it to me. I am now in a great haste, as it may appear unto you. It shall be suffocants. Drink some wine. Ere you go, fare you well. Go, good partner, go. Get you to Francis Seacole. Bid him bring his pen and inkhorn to the jail. We are now to examination these men. And we must do it wisely. We will spare for no wit, I warrant you. Here's that shall drive some of them to a non-come. Only get the learned writer to set down our excommunication and meet me at the jail. Come, Friar Francis, be brief, only to the plain form of marriage, and you shall count their particular duties afterwards. You come hither, my lord, to marry this lady? No. <laughs> oh, to be married to her, Friar, you came, you came to marry her. Lady, you come hither to be married to this count? I do. If either of you know any inward impediment why you should not be conjoined, charge you on your souls to utter it. Know you any, hero? None, my lord. Know you any, Count? I dare to make his answer none. 
Oh, what men dare do, what men may do, what men daily do, not knowing what they do. Oh, no, interjection. So I then some be of laughing. Is... <laughs> Stand thee by, friar. Father, by your leave, will you with free and unconstrained soul give me this major daughter? As freely, son, as God gave her me. And what have I to give you back, whose worth may counterpose this rich and precious gift? Nothing, unless you render her again. Sweet prince, you learn me noble thankfulness. There, Leonardo, take her back again. Give not this rotten orange to your friend. She's but the sign and semblance of her honor. Behold, how like a maid she blushes here. Would you not swear, all you that see her, that she were a maid by these exterior shows? But she is none. She knows the heat of a luxurious bed. Her blush is guiltiness, not modesty. What do you mean, my lord? Not to be married, not to knit my soul to an approved wanton. Dear my lord, in your own proof, have you vanquished the resistance of her youth and defeat of her virginity? I know what you would say. If I have known her, you will say she did embrace me as a husband and so accentuate the forehand sin. No, Leonardo, I never tempted her with a word too large, but as a brother to a sister showed bashful sincerity and calmly love. And seemed I ever otherwise to you? Out on the seeming? I will rant against it. You seem to me as Diana in her orb, as chaste as is the bud ere it to be blown. But you are more intemperate in your blood than Venus, or those pampered animals that rage in savage sensuality. Is my lord well, that he doth speak so wide? Wait, prince, why speak not you? What should I speak? I stand dishonored that I've gone about to link my dear friend to that of a common stale. Are these things spoken, or do I but dream? They are spoken, and these things are true. This looks not like a nuptial. What man was he talked with you yesterday at out at your window between twixt and twelve and one? Now, if you are made answer to this, I talked with no man at that hour, my lord. Why, then you are no maiden, Leonardo. I'm sorry, you must hear. Upon mine honor, myself, my brother, and this grieved count did see her, hear her, at that hour late last night, talk with a ruffian at our chamber window, who hath indeed most like a liberal villain confessed the vile encounters they had had a thousand times in secret. Bye, bye. They are not to be named, my lord, not to be spoke of. There is not chastity enough in language without offense to utter them. Thus, pretty lady, I am sorry for thy much misgovernment. O oh, hero, what a hero hadst thou been, if half thy outward grace has been placed about thy thoughts and counsels of thy heart. But fare thee well, most foul, most fair. Farewell, though pure in piety and impish purity, for thee I'll lock up all the gates of love, and on my eyelids shall conjecture hang, to turn all beauty into thoughts of harm, and never shall be more gracious. Hath no man's dagger here to point for me? Oh no, cousin, wherefore sink you down? Come, let us go. These things come thus to light, smother her spirits up. How doth the lady? That I think. Help, uncle, hero, my hero, uncle, Senor Benedict, friar. Oh, fate, taking it out away, thy heavy hand, death is the fairest cover for her shame that may be wished for. How oh, now, cousin hero? Have comfort, lady. Dost thou look up? Yea, wherefore should she not? Wherefore? Why doth not every earthly thing cry shame upon her? Could she here deny the story that was printed in her blood? Do not live, hero. Do not ope thine eyes. <laughs> Why wast thou ever lovely in my eyes? Sir, sir, be patient. For my part, I am so attired and wonder I know not what to say. Oh, my soul, my cousin is belied. Lady, were you her bedfellow last night? No, truly not. Although, until last night, I have this twelve month been her bedfellow. <laughs> confirmed! Confirmed! Would the two princes lie in Claudio lie, who loved her so that speaking of her foulness washed it with tears hence from her? Let her die! Lady, what man is he you are accused of? You know that do accuse me. I know none. If I know none of any man alive, then that which a maiden modesty doth warrant, let all my sins lack mercy, O oh, my father, prove you that any man with me conversed at hours of meat, or that I yesternight maintained the, the change of wards with any creature, refuse me, hate me, torture me to death. 
There is some strange misprison in the princes. Two of them have the very bent of honor. And if their wisdoms be misled in this, the practice of it lives in John the Bastard, whose spirits toil in the frame of villainies. I know not. They speak the truth of her. These hands shall tear her if they wrong her honor. The proudest of them shall swear of it. Pause a while and let my counsel sway you in this case. Your daughter here, the prince is left for dead. Let her a while be secretly kept in and publish it that she is dead indeed. For it so falls out that what we have, we prize not to the worth whilst we enjoy it. But being lacked and lost, why then we rack the value. Then we find the virtue that possession would not show us whilst it was ours. So will it fare with Claudio. When he shall hear she died upon his words, the idea of her life shall sweetly creep in to his study of imagination. And every lovely organ of her life shall come appareled in more precious habit, more moving delicate and full of life, into the eye and prospect of his soul, than when she lived indeed. Then shall he mourn if ever love had interest in his liver, and wish he had not so accused her. Signor Leonardo, let the friar advise you. Being that I follow in grief, the smallest twine may lead me. Come, lady. Die to live this wedding day, perhaps is but prolonged. Have patience and endure. Lady Beatrice, have, have you wept all this while? Yea, and I will weep a while longer. I will not desire that. Have no reason. I do it freely. Surely I do believe your fair cousin is wronged. <laughs> How much might the man deserve of me that would right her? Is there any way to show such friendship? Very even way, but no such friend. May a man do it? Man's office, but it's not yours. I do love nothing in the world so well as you. Is that not strange? As <laughs> strange as the thing I know not. It were as possible for me to say I love nothing so well as you, but believe me not, and yet I lie not. I confess nothing, nor I deny nothing. I'm, I'm sorry for my cousin. By my sword, Th Beatrice, thou lovest me. Do not swear and eat it. I will swear by it that you love me, and I will make him eat it that says not I love you. Will you not eat your word? No sauce that can be devised to it. I protest, I love thee. Why then, God, forgive me. What offense, sweet Beatrice. You have stayed in a happy hour. I was about to protest I loved you. And do it with all thy heart. I love you with so much of my heart that none is left to protest. Come, bid me do anything for thee. Kill Claudio. <laughs> Not for the whole wide world. You kill me tonight. Farewell. Very sweet Beatrice. I'm gone, though I'm here. There is no love in you. Nay, I pray you, let me go. Beatrice, what? In faith, I will go. We'll be friends first. I... You, you dare easier be friends with me than fight with mine enemy? Is Claudio thine enemy? Is he not approved in the height of villain that I slandered, scorned, dishonored my kinswoman? Oh, that I were a man. What bear her in hand until they come to take hands and then with public accusation, uncovered slander, unmitigated rancor. God, that I were a man, I would eat his heart in the marketplace. Hear me, Beatrice. I... Talk with a man out of a window, a proper nay, thing. Nay, but Beatrice. Sweet hero, she is wrong, she is slandered, she is undone. Beatrice, please, just. Princes and counties, oh, that I were a man for his sake, or that I had a friend that would be a man for my sake. But manhood is melted into courtesies, valor into compliment, and men are only turned into tongue, and trim ones too. He's now as valiant as Hercules and only tells a lie and swears it. I cannot be a man with wishing, therefore I will die a woman with grieving. Terry, good Beatrice, by this hand I love thee. Use it for my love some other way than swearing by it. Think you in your soul that Count Claudio hath wronged Hero? Yea, as sure as I have a thought or a soul. Enough. I am engaged. I will challenge him. I will kiss your hand, and so I leave you. By this hand, Claudio shall render me a dear account. As you hear of me, so think of me. Go. Comfort your cousin. I must say she is dead. And so, farewell.
Is our whole assembly appeared? Oh, a stool and a cushion for the sexton. Which be the malefactors? Mary, that am I and my partner. Nay, that's certain. We have the exhibition to examine. But which are the offenders that are to be examined? Let them come before Master Constable. Yea, Mary, let them come before me. What is your name, friend? Baraccio. Pray, write down Baraccio. Yours, Sarah? I am a gentleman, sir. My name is Conrad. Write down Master Gentleman Conrad. Masters, do you serve God? Yes, yes sir. Yes, sir, we hope. We hope. Write down that they hope they serve God, and write God first, for God defend, but God should go before such villains. Masters, it is proved already that you are little better than lying knaves, and it will go near to be thought so shortly. How answer you for yourselves? Mary, sir, we say we are none. <laughs> a marvelous witty fellow, I assure you, but I will go about with him. Come you hither, sir, a word in your ear. Sir, I say to you, it is thought that you are false knaves. Sir, I say to you, we are none. Well, stand aside. For God, they are both in a tale. Have you writ it down that they are none? Master Constable, you go not the way to examine. You must call forth the watch that are their accusers. Yea, Mary, that's the eftest way. Let the watch come forth. Masters, I charge you in the prince's name, accuse these men. This man said, sir, that Don John, the prince's brother, was a villain. Write down Prince John a villain. Why, this is flat perjury to call a prince's brother a villain. Master Constable. Pray thee, fellow, peace. I do not look like thy, I promise thee. What heard you him say else? Mary, that he received a thousand ducats of Don John accusing the lady here wrongfully. Flat burglary as ever was committed. Yea, by mass that it is. What else, fellow? And that Count Claudio did mean, upon his words, to disgrace Hero in front of the whole assembly and not marry her. Oh, villain! Thou wilt be condemned into everlasting redemption for this. What else? This is all. And this is more, masters, than you can deny. Prince John is this morning secretly stolen away. Hero was in this manner accused, in this very manner refused, and upon the grief of this suddenly died. Master Constable, let these men be bound and brought to Leonardo's. I will go before and show him their examination. Come, let them be opinioned. Let them be in the hands of Coxcomb. God's my life. Where's the sexton? Let him write down the prince's officer, Coxcomb. Come bind them, thou naughty varlet. Away. You are an ass. Yes, you are an ass. Dost thou not suspect my place? Dost thou not suspect my years? Oh, that he were, he were here to write me down an ass. But masters, remember that I am an ass, though it not be written down. Yet forget not that I am an ass. No, thou villain, thou art full of piety, as shall be proved upon thee by good witness. I am a wise fellow, and which is more, an officer, and which is more, a householder, and which is more, as pretty a piece of flesh as any is in Messina. And one that knows the law go to, and a rich fellow enough go to, and a fellow that hath had losses, and one that hath two gowns and everything handsome about him. Bring him away, oh, that I had been ricked down an ass. Now, senor, what news? Good day, my lord. We have been up and down to seek thee, for we are high-proof melancholy and would fain have it beaten away. Wilt thou use thy wit? It is in my scabbard. Shall I draw it? Dost thou wear thy wit by thy side? Never any did so, though very many have been beside their wit. I will bid thee, draw as we do the minstrels, draw to pleasure us. As I am an honest man, he looks pale. Art thou sick? Or angry. What courage, man? What though care killed a cat? Thou hast metal enough in thee to kill care. Sir, I shall meet your wit in the career, and you charge it against me. I pray you choose another subject. But when shall we set the savage bull's horns on the sensible Benedict's head? Yea, and text underneath, here dwells Benedict, the married man. By oh, this light he changes more and more. I think he'd be angry indeed. If he be, he knows how to turn his girdle. Can I speak a word in your ear? God bless me from a challenge. You are a villain. I just not. I'll make it good how you dare, with what you dare, and when you dare. 
Do me right or I'll protest your cowardice. You have killed a sweet lady and her death shall fall heavy on you. Let me hear from you. Well, I will meet you so I may have good cheer. My lord, for your many courtesies, I thank you. I must discontinue your company. Your brother, the bastard, has fled from Messina. You have among you killed a sweet and innocent lady. For my lord Lackbeard there, he and I shall meet. Until then, peace be with him. Did he not say my brother was fled? Officers, what offense have these men done? Mary, sir, they have committed false report. Moreover, they have spoken untruths. Secondarily, they are slanders. Sixth and lastly, they have belied a lady. Thirdly, they have verified unjust things, and to conclude, they are lying knaves. First, I ask thee what they have done. Thirdly, I ask thee what's their offense. Sixth and lastly, why they are committed, and to conclude, what lay you to their charge? Rightly reasoned, and in his own division. And by my troth, there's one meaning well suited. Who have you offended, masters, that you are thus bound to your answer? This learned constable is too cunning to be understood. What's your offense? Let me go no further to mine answer. Do you hear me? Let this count kill me. I have deceived even your very eyes. What your wisdoms could not discover, these shallow fools have brought to light, who in the night overheard me confessing how Don John, your brother, incensed me to slander the Lady Hero, how you were brought into the orchard and saw me court Margaret in Hero's garments, how you disgraced her when you should have when you should marry her, my villainy they have upon record, which I had rather seal with my death than repeat over to my shame. The lady is dead upon mine and my master's false accusation, and briefly, I desire nothing but the reward of a villain. Runs not this speech like iron through your blood. I've drunk poison while he uttered it. But did my brother set you on to this? Yea, and he paid me richly for the practice of it. He is composed and framed of treachery and fled upon this villainy. Sweet hero, now thy image doth appear in the rare semblance that I loved at first. Come, bring away the plaintiffs. By this time our sex cannot reform, Senor Leonardo, of the matter. And masters, do not forget to specify when time and place shall serve that I am an ass. Here, here comes master Senor Leonardo. Which is the villain? Let me see his eyes. That when I know another man like him, I may avoid him. Which of these is he? If you would know your wronger, look on me. Art thou the slave that which thy breath hast killed mine innocent child? Yea, even I alone. No, not so, villain. Thou beliest thyself. Here stand a pair of honorable men. A third has fled that had a hand in it. I thank you, princess, for my daughter's death. Record it with your high worthy deeds. Twas bravely done if you if you bethink you of it. I know not how to pray your patience, yet I must speak. Choose your revenge yourself. Impose me to what penance your invention can lay upon my sin. Yet sinned I not, but am mistaken. By my soul nor I, and yet to satisfy this good old man, I bend under any heavy weight he would enjoin me to. I cannot bid you bid my daughter live. That were impossible. But I pray you both possess the people in Messina here, how innocent she died. And if your love can labor aught in sad invention, hang her an epitaph upon her tomb and sing it to her bones. Sing it tonight, sing it tomorrow morning. Come to my house and since you cannot be my son-in-law, be yet my nephew. My brother hath a daughter, almost a copy of my child that's dead, and she alone is the heir to both of us. Give her the right that you should have given her cousin, and so dies my revenge. O oh, noble sir, your overkindness doth wring tears from me. I do embrace your offer and dispose for henceforth the poor Claudio. Tomorrow then, I will expect your coming. Tonight I take my leave. This naughty man shall face to face what he brought to, and be brought to Margaret, who I believe packed in all this wrong, hired to it by your brother. No, by my soul she was not. 
nor knew not what she did when she spoke to me, but always hath been just and virtuous in anything that I know by her. Moreover, sir, which is indeed not under white and black, this plaintiff here, the accused, did call me an ass. I beseech you, let it be remembered in a sentence. I thank thee for thy care and honest pains. Go, I discharge thee for, of thy prisoner, and I thank thee. I leave an errant knave with your worship, which I beseech your worship to correct yourself for the example of others. God, keep your worship. I wish your worship well. God, restore you to health. I humbly give you leave to depart. And if a merry meeting may be wished, God prohibit it. Come, neighbor. Until tomorrow morning, lords. Farewell. You will not fail. Bring you these fellows on. Pray thee, sweet mistress Margaret, deserve well at my hands by helping me to the speech of Beatrice. Will you then write me a sonnet in praise of my beauty? <laughs> in so high a style, Margaret, that no man living shall come over it, for in most comely truth thou deservest it. To have no man come over me? Why shall I keep below stairs? Thy wit is as quick as a greyhound's mouth, it catches. And yours is blunt as Spencer's foil, which hit but hurt not. A most manly wit, Margaret. It will not hurt a woman. And so I pray thee, call Beatrice. I give thee the buckler. Give us the swords. We have bucklers of our own. If you use them, Margaret, you must put in the pikes with a vice, and they are dangerous weapons for maids. Well, I will call Beatrice to you, who I think hath legs. And therefore will come. The God of love that sits above and knows me, and knows me, how pitiful I deserve. Why they were never so truly turned over and over as my poor self in love. Mary, I cannot show it in rhyme. I have tried. I can find out no rhyme to lady but baby. An innocent rhyme for scorn, horn. A hard rhyme for school, fool. A babbling rhyme. Very ominous endings, no. I was not born under a rhyming planet, nor can I not woo in festival terms. Sweet Beatrice, what is thou come when I called thee? Yes, yeah, senor, depart when you bid me. Stay till then. Then is spoken. Fare you well now, and yet ere I go, let me go that I came, which is with knowing what hath passed between you and Claudio. Only foul words, and thereupon I will kiss thee. Foul words, but foul wind, and foul wind is but foul breath, and foul breath is noisome. Therefore I will depart unkissed. Thou hast frightened the word out of his right sense, though forcible is thy wit. But I must tell thee plainly, Claudio undergoes my challenge, and either I must shortly hear from him, or I'll subscribe him a coward. And I pray thee now, tell me, for which of my bad parts didst thou fall in love with me first? For them all together, which maintain so politic a state of evil that they will not admit any good part to intermingle with them. But for which of my good parts did you first suffer love for me? Suffer love, a good epithet. I do suffer love indeed, for I love thee against my will. In spite of your heart, I think. Alas, poor heart. If you spite it for my sake, I will spite it for yours, for I will never love that which my friend hates. Thou and I are too wise to woo peaceably. <laughs> um, no, tell me, uh, how doth your cousin? Very ill. And how do you? Very ill, too. Serve God. Love me and mend. There, I'll leave you too. For here comes one in haste. Madam, you must come to your uncle. Yonder's old coil at home. It is proved my lady hero hath been falsely accused. The prince and Claudio mightily abused. And Don John is the author of it all. Who is sped and gone? Will you come presently? Will you go hear this news, senor? I will live in thy heart, die in thy lap, and be buried in thy eyes. 
And moreover, I will go with thee to thy uncle's. Did I not tell you she was innocent? So are the prince and Claudio who accused her upon the error that you heard debated. But Margaret was in some fault for this, although against her will, as it appears, in a true course of all the question. Well, I'm glad that all things sort so well. And so am I, being else by faith enforced to call young Claudio to a reckoning for it. Well, daughter, you and your gentlewoman all withdraw into your chamber by yourselves, and I will send for you. Come hither masked. Friar, I must entreat your pains, I think. To do what, senor? To bind me or undo me, one of them. Senor Leonardo, truth it is, good senor. Your niece regards me with an eye of favor. That my daughter lent her? Tis most true. And I do with an eye of love requite her. The sight whereof I think you had from me, from Claudio and the prince. But what is your will? Your answer, sir, is enigmatical, but for my will, my will is your good will, may stand with ours this day to be conjoined in the state of honorable marriage, in which, good friar, I shall desire your help. My heart is with your liking. And my help. Here comes the prince and Claudio. Good morrow to this fair assembly. Good morrow, prince. Good morrow, Cla Claudio. We here attend you. Are you yet determined today to marry with my brother's daughter? I'll hold my mind were she an ancient hag. Call her forth. Here's the friar ready. Which is the lady I must seize upon? The same as she, and I do give you her. Why then, she's mine. Sweet, let me see your face. No, that you shall not. Tell you take her hand before this friar and swear to marry her. Give me your hand before this holy friar. I am your husband if you like of me. And when I lived, I was your other wife. And when you loved, you were my other husband. Another hero. Nothing certain. Or one hero died defiled, but I do live. And truly as I live, I am a maid. Oh, my hero. Hero that is dead. She died, my lord. But whiles her slander lived. All this amazement can I qualify. When after that the holy rites are ended, I'll tell you largely of fair hero's death. Meantime, let wonder seem familiar, and to the chapel let us presently. Soft and fair friar, which is Beatrice? I answer to that name. What is your will? Do not you love me? I know, no more than reason. Why then, your uncle and the prince and Claudio have been deceived. They swore you did. Do not you love me? Troth, no, no more than reason. Why then, my cousin Margaret and Ursula are much deceived, for they did swear you did. They swore you were almost sick for me. Well, they swore you were well nigh dead for me. Tis no such matter. Then do you not love me? No, truly, but in friendly recompense. Um, cousin, I'm sure you love the gentleman. And I'll be sworn upon that he loves her, for here's a paper written in his own hand, a halting sonnet of his own pure brain, fashioned to Beatrice. And here's one more, written in my cousin's hand, stolen from her pocket, containing her affection unto Benedict. A miracle. Here's her own hands against our hearts. Come, I'll have thee, but by this light I take thee for pity. I would not deny you, but by this good day I yield upon great persuasion, and partly to save your life, for I was told you were in consumption. Peace, I will stop your mouth. How dost thou, Benedict, the married man? I'll tell thee what, prince. A college of my wit crackers cannot flout me out of my humor. Dost thou think I will care for a satire and epigram? If a man will be beaten with brains, it shall wear nothing handsome about him. In brief, since I do propose to marry, I will think nothing to any purpose that the world can say against it, and therefore never flout, me at, never flout at me for what I have said against it. For a man is a giddy thing, and this is my conclusion. For thy part, Claudio, I did think to have beaten thee, but in that thou art like to be my kinsman, live unbruised and love my cousin. 
I had well hoped that thou wouldst have denied Beatrice, that I might have cuddled thee out of thy single life to make thee a double dealer, which out of question thou wilt be if my cousin do not look exceedingly narrowly to thee. My lord, your brother John is taken in flight and brought with armed men back to Messina. Ah, think not on him till, till tomorrow. I'll devise thee brave punishments for him. Strike up, Pipers. Come, come, we are friends. Let's have a dance and we are married that we may lighten our own hearts and our wives' heels. We'll have the dancing afterward. Of course, first of my word. Therefore, play music, Prince. Thou art sad, get thee a wife, get thee a wife. 